Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. I'm Peter Martin, Alan Ruff, Alison McConnell and Tammy Manis are here with me and uh, here's what's coming up on today's show. Philippe Clement bemoans the handball rule, branding it harsh after John Suter was punished in the 2-2 draw with Benfica. As uh, somebody who loves football, I have difficulty with, with those rules. Brendan Rodgers insists he will defend the SFA charge rigorously as he confirms he has no regrets over his remarks after the defeat to Hearts. Stephen Naismith believes Hearts have proved they have had a mentality switch after the recent league win over Celtic. I'm not shocked that we beat Celtic on Sunday. We, had, we know we need to work hard and we need to do it, but we gave it when we believe. Um... Nick Montgomery reveals what he thinks will be key to Hibs in their bid to shock Rangers in their Scottish Cup quarter-final clash. It's always about mentality and players playing at this level. They don't get here just on ability, they get here on... Yeah, uh, we missed the crucial part that he was going to tell us there. We'll get it later on. <laughs> you, you don't get there just with ability. There's much more to it, but we'll hear from Nick a little later on in the programme. There's lots to discuss. Uh, thank you very much to so many of you for engaging with us. And, of course, if you want to join the football family, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. And if you want all the latest breaking football news, and unique video content, then why not download the PLZ Soccer app? Uh, and with that, football is what we talk about, near and far, Scottish at our heart. Uh, and then we'll have a wee look at what's happening down south in the English Premier League as well. So, uh, with that in mind, Ruffy, it's just a fantastic night for Rangers last night. Yeah, another super performance. I think we all thought, you know, away from home, it might be a wee bit more difficult, but... No, they gave as, as good as they got. You know, it could have went either way. Both teams had chances. But uh, unfortunately, the away goal rule doesn't count. Well, they'll be happier, I think. So I don't think the, the, the tie's done and dusted. I think the next game will be similar to that one we saw last night. Yeah, uh, I mean, I just I can't remember, Tom, but out of the four of us on Monday, I predicted Rangers would get through over the two legs. I thought that. Did you? Were you in yeah, that yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I did as well, Pete. I don't think it's a, a vintage Benfica side. I think that obviously the result with the week before, you know, getting hammered from Porto five nothing. I think that the last ten fifteen minutes they started to put a lot of pressure on the Rangers. And Rangers, you know, dug in, got the draw. <coughs> I think Rangers are now maybe sixty forty favourites now. I think getting back to Ibrox, as Ruffy said, they're unfortunately you've not got the away goal rule um, now. But I think Rangers at a packed Ibrox are more than capable of of winning that game. I thought they caused Benfica a lot of problems on the night and. Defended strongly, uh, and I just think you know it's set up for for Rangers to get through now. At Ibrox. Well, uh, the way they orchestrated the first goal, it just gives you that confidence boost. You know, the game starts off Benfica tippy tappy, gaining all that control, and then boom, Rangers get the first goal mm, from Tom fantastic, Lawrence. Yeah, fantastic delivery for the goal actually, and fantastic header. Yeah, I, I think Rangers will be irritated. They'll be a bit frustrated at not coming away. With the win, I know they were under huge amounts of pressure for much of the second half, but when you look at the goal that, that levels it to take it to 2 all, uh, you know, Conor Goldson, it's just a moment of madness, really, that header into, into his own net. I think they'll feel as though they, they might have just withstood some of that pressure and, take, and have taken the win away. Um, but I think, I, I would fancy Rangers to go through. I think at Ibrox have proven to be fairly formidable uh, with the crowd behind them, with a huge backing, a huge expectation. To go through, I would back them to, to go on now and, and go into the quarter final. Yeah, um, I, I don't. I, I, you've got to look at the positives, Ruffy. I'm, I, I think any result like that away from home, yeah. scoring two goals, and to get back, as Alison said, to a packed tie box. Now there are see there are certain key, uh, key elements in Rangers that I think make them, you know, a good bet in a European game, uh, especially over the last couple of years. This season, it's almost certainly Jack Butland. Yeah, he's made the important saves. Uh, we saw it with Alan McGregor uh, when he was in there, you know, particularly in European nights. A goalkeeper, most goalkeepers can make saves, there's no doubt about that, but it's making the crucial one. Everybody's talking about the one he had first when he palmed it. I thought the one where he, he stopped it with his legs was just as important. And he keeps it, keeps the team in the, the game and they keep believing. But uh, I've said this all along, I, th I think Rangers' style of football suits European football rather than the hur hurly burly of our game. Yeah. And I just think that uh, they've got certain players in there who love European nights. Well done, Ruffy. I haven't had hurly burly since I was in fifth year <laughs> at school. That's fantastic. <laughs> he's, one of, he's, one of, he's one of your MB bars, will you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom, penalty? I thought it was. Because they went either way, Peter. I think the handball rule was. 
it's causing a lot of havoc throughout Europe, not just in Scotland, but in, in, in Europe as well. Um, I, I thought it kind of deflected up on his hand, and I didn't think that was supposed to be a penalty. We are talking about it earlier, Alison said, you know, depending on the angle you look at. I thought it was harsh, Peter, but you look at the one that Celtic gave away at the weekend there, and it's this silhouette, and they need to change the handball rule, Peter, because it's just going to keep causing problems. I thought Rangers were it was harsh on Rangers. Um, but, you know, there was no really harm done. Uh, they get, the, get them back to to Ibrox with a real chance and I think that Benfica will come and try and attack Rangers and that suits Rangers. Roughly we're speaking about Rangers in Europe. I don't think teams have got maybe a lot of respect for Rangers. I just think they, they think they'll run over the top of them and they'll go and attack them. And Rangers have proved over the last couple of seasons that when teams come onto them and attack them, they're, they're capable of hitting them in the counter. Yeah, you used the word there that the Rangers manager, uh, Philippe Clement, also thought about that penalty. He thought it was harsh. This one, with the rules how they are now, you can give, uh, but as uh, somebody who loves football, I have difficulty with, with those rules. Like all the managers, I think, and all the players, that it's too harsh now that a ball that's clearly not intended to go against your arm, the moment it touches you, it's penalty. And too many games are all over, uh, all over the world eh, are decided in that way also. I agree with them. I think they should change it. I mean, as ever with football, they'll wait and maybe think about it in the summer. Um, the only problem with that is, do they wait uh, till after the European Championships mm. and then cause even more consternation? I think for me, I think it would be nice to go back to a, a really unambiguous and clear line where it is hand to ball. That's the interpretation. Not, not ball to hand, but hand to ball. That There has to be a deliberate move to play the ball with your hand, I think. I thought that penalty was very harsh last night and I think any team that concedes a penalty like that will feel hard done by. I think um, it's not within the spirit of the game. There's no intent to play the ball with your hand. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to manipulate a situation to cheat. I think uh, it's entirely accidental. You cannot jump for a ball without raising your arms. Where on earth are you supposed to put your arms at that moment in time? Uh, yeah, for me, it's not a penalty. I can understand why it's given when we see the rules. I think the rules are flawed. I would like to see something that was more within the ethos of what the game is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it depends on what you are as a person. You'll have to analyse yourself. Are you a, a glass half full or a glass half empty? Certainly a 2-2 draw away in Portugal against Benfica. Philippe Clement is uh, praising his players to the high heavens. I'm really somebody who's demanding towards them, but I cannot ask more than what they give today. They gave their, their mole, uh, everything, also the guys who came in. Uh, we miss a lot of players in the offensive uh, positions, so other players had to do the job. I'm very happy also with Fabio and Dujon doing that role really good in this game. So we need to continue like this. and. Uh, if they keep this mentality, what they've been showing the last couple of months, then uh, then it can be an amazing season. I think they're going to go through. You, Ruffy? Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, I think they'll have the advantage of the extra time as well, if needed, uh, at home, which will be again, you know. Yeah, I think they will just get through. Yeah, Ali? Yeah, I think they'll go through. I thought, yeah. yeah. Yep, I think I don't think Benfica are good travellers. I think they've, they've not won the last four away games, so I think Rangers will beat them. Yeah, um, I'll tell you one thing that's good, Ruffy. Um, the, the, the draw gets us points. Uh, we desperately need coefficient points, and Rangers, as ever, have been flying the flag regularly. Um, and I think we are still just in 10th place, and the Czech Republic are hunting us down. Yeah, I think uh, I think Liverpool did us a favour last night, didn't they? They yeah. spanked one of them. Spartak. Yeah, so you know, yeah. Or Sparta. Yeah, we we just have to keep in there. You know, you hope they can get as far a favourable if they win this one a favourable result result in the next one because it, it doesn't seem to be that massive big teams out there in this competition just now. So another favourable draw in the next round in the semi final. Here's the rundown on it, Ali. Uh, Scotland could drop to 11th. Mm -hmm. um, Rangers have the highest club coefficient of all the teams in Europe outside of the top 10. So if Rangers were to win the league next season and the UEFA Champions League winner has already qualified, then they would get an automatic qualification spot. Um, if Celtic win the league, they'd have to play a playoff because their coefficient points are lower. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting one. I think, uh, I think it's been such a substantial carrot recently to go and win the league knowing that you have that immediate access 
to the Champions League and, and all the riches that it offers. I think Celtic in particularly know full well just how tough the qualifying route can be. I think um, they found it particularly difficult when it comes to trying to qualify to make it into the group stages. And of course, we know now from next year that it's an entirely revamped uh, competition that they'll be going into. I think um, I think Celtic have underachieved in Europe across recent seasons. I think when you look at some of the some of the results, I think um, that's manifested in the, the coefficient, and I think they'll be kicking themselves at points with uh, with something that leaves them then potentially facing a, a qualifier. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are some clubs looking at winning the Scottish yeah. Cup. Some are looking at winning a double. Some are looking at winning a quadruple. Of course, this is Scottish Cup weekend, and Kerry Pollock has been speaking to a few legends. Graham Souness, Neil Lennon, Alan Stubbs and Stuart Lovell met at Hampden Park earlier this week to preview this weekend's Scottish Gas Men's Scottish Cup quarter-final ties. Rangers will travel to Easter Road in what could be considered in the most eye-catching tie of the weekend. Former Rangers manager Graham Souness is optimistic about the club's end to the season due to impressive displays under new manager Philippe Clement. When I was part of the inter interview process, you know, I always, and when I see new managers being interviewed, I put myself back in the dressing room as a player. And I think would he hold my attention? And when we interviewed him, I said that I said I like that. I think um, he might be the man. Um, and I, I am someone that would listen to him. Across the city, Celtic manager Brendan Rodgers has been subject to some criticism from his own fans, but ex Hoops boss Neil Lennon still backs his fellow countrymen to turn things around. I, I think that takes time. You know what I mean? Um, he's a quality manager, and he's proved that over his career. I, I do believe he will he will get it right. He's an elite manager. Um, maybe the team aren't as playing as well as he would like, but you will go through you know periods like that in our managerial career. Alan Stubbs knows a thing or two about winning this cup as a manager and is hoping for an upset at Easter Road. There, there would have been probably other other fixtures or other teams in the in these this next round of of games that they probably would have picked before before Hibs, uh, and I think that tells you how tricky a tie can be. The Premiership's bottom club, Livingston, face a tough tie away to Celtic, but former Cup-winning captain Stuart Lovell thinks the match offers a welcome break from a difficult league campaign. I think it could be a, 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 a maybe a good distraction for Livingston in that they've had a tough time, they're sitting bottom of the table, and um, I think a Cup game might just be a come at a good time for them just to say this is a free hit. No one is expecting Livingston to, to get a result. Will we see any cup upsets this weekend? Stay tuned across all of PLZ Soccer's social media channels for all the latest breaking headlines. I just wonder, uh, I'm wondering if there's a, there's a cold sweat for yourself when you've seen Stuart Lovell there again after that day at Hamden when he was in the Livingston colours. That's right, he was a captain for Livingston and I played with him at Hibs as well. I, I, that's not great memories, seen Archie. I have a time I bump into him, he mentions it as well. Yeah, <laughs> as you would. <laughs> uh, Livingston legend, uh, probably the one and only cup they'll ever win, but they've done it against us, which was... The Jonah strikes again, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's a beautiful frame with the medal in it and the and the shirt he has in his house. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I haven't seen it, I'm only winding you up. But uh, nevertheless, um, of course, that's legends looking at it and assessing the managers and, and the sides uh, involved. Hibs against Rangers. At, it's tie of the weekend. It's, a, yeah. it's an absolute humdinger. Hibs are getting better. Rangers are just flying. Although I have to say, in fairness to Philippe Clément, and he hasn't mentioned it at times, um, th they've had injuries. You know, there's still key players not available to him, and they're still producing the likes of that draw against Benfica. Yeah, they certainly are. But as they said the other day, there anybody's coming in, they're doing well. There's young Cole McKinnon, who was at Patrick Thistle last year, thrown into a European tie. God, he must be absolutely in heaven with that. I don't know how that came about, but he's not. He's not frightened to throw these kind of players in there. He knows he's training with them. You know, he knows how good they are. You know, but I, I think Hibs will be looking, hoping that there is some kind of reaction for that game that last night. The travelling aspect, the players recovering. We heard Lenny talking about when you go to Europe. You know, it takes certain players longer to get their, their act together. So Hibs will be hoping that is the scenario. But they're in a good bit of form just now, so I think it'll be a, another tough tie for Rangers. Yeah, let's find out about Nick Montgomery. Allison went all the way through to the capital into the Hibs camp.
Hibs and Rangers will do battle for a place in the Scottish Cup semi-final when they meet at Easter Road on Sunday evening and Nick Montgomery believes his side have all the necessary attributes to go and book that Hamden date. It's always about mentality and players playing at this level. You know, they don't get here just on ability, they get here on having the right mentality and, and, and you know, we know a lot of that is, is, is a big thing as opposed to what level you play at. Um, and, and yeah, we've got, some, we've got some good players and we've got a good squad, we've got a strong bench. And of course, Hibs triumph when they beat Rangers in the Scottish Cup final in 2016 to end a 114-year wait for the trophy has not been forgotten by anyone in, at Hibs. However, Montgomery would like this side to make their own little bit of history. Yeah, I've heard stories. I've, I've obviously seen the YouTube video of, of the sunshine on Leaf. I think that's probably worldwide. Um, amazing when you watch that. And you know, David Gray is an important member of, of my staff. And the real humble guy, but obviously there's memorabilia of him around the training ground and stuff because yeah, it was a historical moment for the club. Um, so obviously he's got that experience as well of of having success in the cup, but that was a long time ago. And, and yeah, you know, it's uh, it's nice to have that in history books. But right now it's it's a present and, and and the future. So all we can concentrate on is is the game on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Um... This one is, is it going to be, I mean, Rangers really haven't had too much trouble with Hibs. Um, we're hoping it's going to be a humdinger of a tie, but can you see anything um, other than a Rangers but, but I don't win? think Hibs will have a better opportunity than Sunday. I think the two games this season have been dreadful from a Hibs point of view, 4 nothing, 3 nothing. Um, they've got to come out the traps quickly, Hibs. They've got to come out and get after Rangers. They've travelled from an away tie in Portugal. They've had a tough, you know, ninety plus minutes. They're coming probably be back in for a loosen today, and it's right back into a game on Sunday. So Hibs are rested, you know, they're fresh and they're playing well. They're playing with confidence at the minute. So if Hibs can start the game well and just get the fans behind them uh, and maybe get the first goal, then I think they can go and put Rangers out. But it's going to be tough. I mean, Rangers, Rangers have had the better, not not just this season, but I think 13, 14 games. You know, Hibs have not laid a, a glove on uh, on Rangers, so. It's a, it's a tough tie for Hibs, but I think I think they could possibly nick it at the end if they can start well. Um, so I'll go for a Hibs win. Yeah, what one nil? Uh, no, I don't think I'll keep a clean sheet. Two one to Hibs. Two one to Hibs. Okay, um, Ruffy. They need to score first. Yeah, that's what they, they, yeah. they need to score. They need to put a bit of doubt in the Rangers' mind. Uh, I think it'll go all the way. Uh, I, I do think Hibs are in good form. I think uh, over ninety <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I can see it coming. Uh, but I think Rangers eventually. <laughs> <laughs> in injury time, uh, but I think both goalkeepers are going to play a big part in this game. Hold on a minute, Rangers are going to win it in injury time. Do one. My God, that is specific now. <laughs> You're really kind of a yeah. focusing in on exactly. I just didn't want to say two one Rangers. Yes, I to sort of a build it up into something yeah. and then two one Rangers. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I do agree with you. I think it's going to be tight. I think Rangers will win it. You? I think Rangers will win it. I just don't see any evidence there. I think Hibs have been better. I think you've seen a more cohesive Hibs since the break. Uh, I think the players that have come in on loan. I think they've made a difference. But yeah, I think Rangers are too strong for them. Change the system, Peter, which <clears> is going to help. Yeah, he's playing, he's playing with two and the one, uh, rather than the four four two, and I think that will help massively because you know Rangers are going to play four three three. That's the way they play, and you need to, you need the three in the middle of the park against Rangers, and that will make a difference from the, the previous two games this season where Hibs have been ran over the top in the middle of the park. Okay, um, just before we move on from uh, obviously the the talk of Hibs against Rangers, and we've been discussing uh, Benfica Rangers in the uh, Europa League last night. Uh, I mentioned to uh, a Rangers fan who sadly lost his life. Thomas McAllister passed away in Lisbon uh, in the uh, at the game uh, against Benfica. The circumstances of his death are not known at the moment, but I think uh, Rangers have released a statement um, offering their condolences to the family. Uh, and I think from everybody here, our thoughts and prayers with their family at this time. Um, for such a young man at 25 to lose his life going to a football match, it is an absolute tragedy. So I think uh, it puts football in perspective and I think all our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Thomas uh, McAllister's family at this point. So from one tie in the quarterfinal, we'll move on to Celtic against Livingston. Just before we talk about uh, the overall game itself, um, there is obviously an issue which has 
I don't know if it's gone under the radar. It's certainly been a, uh, a hotly contested uh, story um, from so many sides. If I could just put something in as a foreword to it, Alison, before obviously I get the thoughts of the panel on it. Oli Labada uh, has left to sign for MLS side Charlotte FC. Um, the deal is worth around £10 million. Um, if add-ons become a feature on it, I'm sure Celtic uh, will eventually reveal that. Um, but he released a statement uh, last night admitting leaving the club was not in his plans. Um, Celtic have kind of been very low-key on this whole transfer. Um, they put it on their website. There wasn't any posts on social media. It was just Leela Bada is leaving. Um, I don't think on this football show we discuss the rights and wrongs or legitimacies of people's opinion on uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict because, quite simply, um, any life lost in any conflict is a life too, too many in my book. The one thing that I think is the issue here is it's been difficult for him to remain there because the pressures uh, that he's been under, and this story has an underlying story of he's he's moved basically because I don't think they're too happy with some Celtic fans who've let their feelings be known and used Celtic Football Club as a platform to highlight a Palestinian cause, and he is an Israeli footballer. I think he's found it very difficult, and I think... I'd have to say, I think the pressure that he has come under has come on, come under e effectively from his colleagues and teammates at, at international level and in his homeland. I think uh, the perception of Celtic and Celtic fans as being pro-Palestinian invited a lot of that pressure that I think he was put under. Uh, I think you saw it when he came back, the game when, when Celtic beat Hibs at Easter Road, the, the last minute penalty and the players and the manager all celebrated with the travelling support and he was straight up the tunnel as soon as the whistle went. I think you knew uh, his head wasn't in the right place. I think Brendan Rodgers had, had mentioned earlier that he just uh, he needed a bit of time before coming back into the team and then when you saw him coming back in he was a shadow of the player that Celtic were used to prior to this conflict really reigniting in October. Um, I think the the pressure has probably been intoler intolerable at times for him. Uh, I think by and large Celtic fans were, were, were very supportive of the, the predicament that he found himself in, a very unique predicament. But I thought his own statement last night that he put out I had a touch of class about it. I thought, uh, I, I thought in very difficult circumstances, he managed to navigate it particularly well. And I, I think Celtic fans would wish him all the best as he as he goes out. And I think the vast majority would understand why he felt as though he wanted to leave. Yeah. Um, now again, um, because some people obviously listen to things in, in small chunks and don't get the overall context of the story. Uh, Avi Luzon, who was the Maccabi PETA president, says on a personal level, Leo felt very bad with everything that was happening, including the indignation of fans on the street towards him on more than one occasion. The fans treated him disgustingly and left him with no choice. Well, we're not privy to the kind of experiences Leo Abada had. As we move on, I thought you summed it up very eloquently there. As we move on, is there a is there almost a door shut on Celtic signing future Israeli players? Um, that's one thing that uh, uh, you know will um, be raised. And on the second point here, and again, offering no um, right or wrong on it, um, merely I suggest whether it's UEFA competition or indeed SPFL with Celtic as a football club. If fans continue to air their views, be it Palestinian flags or things that may well be controversial, there is a fine or a penalty to pay. And it's whether the club continues to come into conflict in a football sense with their own supporters. That's the decision they'll have to make. This is a long story. This doesn't go back just to October in the light of the conflict that we've seen across the last six months or so. This has been a long-standing issue. On a personal level, I think it's very, very difficult to say to people that football exists in a vacuum that we don't, that you don't use it to promote your own political values. I think time and time again, you look through history and you see the role that sport plays in political events. I think it's very difficult to make an argument that, that football exists without all these other noises. Yeah. And I think there are certain clubs, 
and, and Celtic would probably be one of them, or Celtic fans would consider it to be one of them, that is essentially quite a political club because yeah. of its background and its, and its origins. I I'm, think it's I'm very not, hard to I'm not arguing to with the legitimacy of that. I agree with that point, that people have, they will express their right, but within the rules of certain organisations, if you keep doing it, there is a penalty to pay. I think that's inevitable. I think we've seen it. We've seen the fines. I, I don't know off the top of my head how many fines Celtic have had a lot across the last decade. We have seen it. However, I, I'd be fairly sympathetic at times too to people saying, well, hang on a minute, there's a bit of hypocrisy here. You know, how come everyone is encouraged? Like when we see the Ukrainian conflict and you see people come out and football was very, very supportive of that, that issue. And for under, understandably why, you know, I think then you can you can understand why people might say, oh, hang on a wee minute, why is it okay to politicise and, and offer support for one event but maybe not another? I think that's a conversation that maybe you have to have too. Yeah, uh, all organisations. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think it, I think it's a very difficult subject matter, and I don't think it has a blanket yes or no, right or wrong, black and white yeah. conclusion to it. Th there are black and white situations when you see, and I'm not. I'm moving away from uh, Celtic as a club. I'm talking about overall uh, any clubs in Europe. I, I mean, there was a particularly unsavoury banner at AS Roma uh, last night that I found distasteful. A abusive and distasteful comments, I think, um, should also... Uh, I think they suffer the wrath. I think that's when a club can make a stance and say, no, this is wrong, it tarnishes their image. This one, um, again, uh, we can only offer from a, from a point of view, and I, I emphasise this because, as you know, in social media and when things get clipped up, sometimes people lose context on the issue, which is merely on football and the repercussions if you break f rules within uh, that organisation or indeed that competition. Um, and of course, uh, Leela Bada moves on um, without too much fanfare, um, but did they get good money for him, Tam? Yeah, I think they did, Peter. I think, you know, if you look at it when he was at his peak, you know, maybe a couple of seasons ago, you know, and he was flying, you were talking 10, 15 million for him. So I think for Celtic to get the money for a, a player that's, that's unhappy, um, I think it's good money for, for Celtic, but they've got to go and reinvent I mean, Celtic fans will look at it and go, right, we've got 10, 10 million in the bank. You know, are we going to spend it? Probably yeah. not. So, I mean, the Celtic fans are just thinking, you know, we've lost another player and are we going to replace him like for like? Probably not with the money they've got. Well, they've, they've taken in that money, Ruffy, and I think, and I'm not offering an opinion on it, I'm merely offering an observation on it. Quite simply, when you get a situation where, um, you know, Leela Bada moves on um, and the club you know, or the message coming out is they will invest that money on a big player in the summer. Celtic fans are just looking at that and saying, we've heard that record now so often, you know. Yeah, well, they heard it at the, the window there. Uh, they heard Brendan Rodgers saying, uh, I'm going to bring in two, possibly three quality players, not squad players, first team players, you know, even the players that he's brought in and even in the first team. So you can't kid the fans, you know, all the time, you know. They, but I would but you clearly say, can on a sustained yeah, period. Yeah, but I, I think this uh, this season they won't get away with it again. There's no way with the protests and everything and the way the club's been handled and who's been bringing players in and all that carry on. This is the last chance saloon for a lot of people at the club to yeah. do something this summer. Any surprise that Yang's red card against Hearts was thrown out? Yeah, you know, I think we all debated it. We thought it wasn't an intentional kick. He was trying to flick the ball over the boy's head and the boy came in at pace. And he, he couldn't get out the road either. I don't think it was intentional. So I thought the referee gave a yellow card initially and I thought that would have been enough. Yeah, um, no surprise that Brendan Rodgers has been charged with his uh, comments. I think we all knew everybody. We knew <coughs> was coming. Yeah, uh, we could see it coming a mile off. Um, the hearing's going to take place 25 days after the match <laughs> so, so it's not been fast tracked it's, it's just it's just getting to that point where he could be in the stand for the Rangers game <laughs> yeah the timing was everything <laughs> there um, yeah, I, I do wonder about the, the sense of such uh, decisions <coughs> coming so far removed from the game you saw Yang's call it takes place within 40 hours of the game Taking place. I, I, to go back to that point about the the decision not being overturned, I wonder if Brendan's remarks after the game had some kind of influence 
there, whereby you know there, there's a an element of criticism when the referees, of course, then responded to to say we feel as though this has got a bit personal. I don't know if it's just a, a circling of the wagons and saying that you know, Alison, hang on a wee minute. Alison, can I can I say to you, hang on a wee minute? Because <laughs> surely you're not suggesting for a minute they say, well, our backs are up. There's no way we're going to give you the the overturning I'm of the sure card. Quite, I'm not sure it's quite as conscious a decision as that. I don't I don't mean it, it, that it's yes. not just, uh, <clears throat> but I just think somewhere in the background when you feel as though you know, it's been quite, the criticism's yeah. been personal uh, and over the top, that you think, right, we're going to make a show standing by our officials and standing by the official, uh, standing by the decision that was made on the day. I better not laugh at specific points when an answer is made, <laughs> because obviously with Gordon Parks the other week there, I was included in the clip uh, for all the wrong reasons. Um, I, I, I disagree with Alison. I just don't believe for a minute that people start to roll in things to influence them in the decision of Yang. But um, this is what Brendan Rogers had to say on the hearing coming up. Uh, we'll defend it vigorously when the day comes. It was my observation over many games with the consistency of decisions. I understand they make mistakes, but I felt the ones last week were clear errors. Um, OK, some people have thrown out the accusation. Well, you know, <clears throat> they really are. They really are, you know, pushing that out there to deflect away from the fact they lost. Yeah, I think that obviously the timing with Brendan coming out and saying that, you know, and then he says he's been frustrated with previous decisions. Uh, I, I, I think you'll find now, Peter, that when decisions go to an appeal, you'll very rarely get it overturned because there's now VAR involved. So they've got the referee's decision, you've got VAR. And that's the SFA admitting that the referee and VAR both got it wrong if they overturn appeals. And I think you'll find very, very rarely that... I think there has been one this season. will overturn it. Maybe, maybe one, Peter, I don't yeah. know. But <clears throat> I think you'll find very rarely now because they won't want to admit that everyone got it wrong. Um, whereas before it was just a referee. Yeah. I think it was easier to get decisions overturned now. I think you'll find them very rarely overturned. Brendan says it's been many games. Um, has he got a point? Well, I think every manager in the league will, will sit in his office and go... There was many times we've been mm. undone here. Yeah. You know, I think every manager and every team uh, will have something on record, I don't know whether they write it down or whatever they do. And every manager could say, well, we could have another eight points if yeah. we got that, or ten points or whatever. Some do write it down, Ruffy. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that uh, I think it goes away. I think he's thought we're picking our way back to the first game at Hearts, remember? Mm -hmm. That game at Hearts was a penalty. It hit somebody's hand or something, and that started the season of injustice and uh, I think if you go through the whole season you could pick lots of incidents. You're talking about when VAR first came in? Yeah, the fourth, yeah there was the a number of contracts. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was yeah absolutely. Right. Um, well, listen, um, Brendan will put his case across um, and we wait to see what uh, result comes from that. But they're, they're up against a side that, quite simply, uh, they won't have Burnaby. That's another one who's out the door as well. He's gone out and loan. So they're clearly shifting, trying to shift some players out, um, one for a, a reason that probably they would have held on to him, which is a bad uh, Bernabe because it's just not happening. Yeah, I don't think he's been good enough, Peter, <coughs> overall. I think he's uh, he's had plenty of opportunities at Celtic and he's not been able to shift Greg Taylor, let's be honest. And, and, and Greg's a decent fullback, but if, if you're a if you're, you're spending money on somebody, I think you've got to come in and try, you think you can shift Greg Taylor out of that left back position. He couldn't do that. And now, and now he's he's been punted on somewhere else. But that's just another example of the recruitment at Celtic that that hasn't been good enough over recent seasons. They won't slip up against Livingston because if they do, um, never mind. Ruffy suggesting there's going to be repercussions towards the end of the season with the league title on the line. Um, they'd be stampeding towards the gates of Celtic Park. Yeah, I don't see it, Peter. I think Livingston are are not playing with a lot of confidence at the minute. I think if Celtic can get the early goal. And Livingston it opened up a little bit, then I think it could be a heavy defeat for Livingston. Livingston will go and put 11 men behind the ball and try and keep it nil nil as long as possible. I just don't think they've got any threat at the other end of the pitch. And I think it will just be waves of attack for Celtic, and eventually that pressure will tell. And I think Celtic win that game comfortably. Uh, David Martin Deal, it's not been great for Livingston of late, and clearly everybody thinks they're going to drop down into the championship. But for this game, it's a, it's a free hit, and Kerry Pollock's been out there to speak to the Livingston boss. David Martindale's mindset switches away from league action this weekend as his side take on Celtic at Celtic Park in the quarterfinals of the Scottish Cup. And having stood on the sidelines of Parkhead before, the Levy boss knows all too well that his game plan might take a few twists and turns. As you look at the, the Copenhagen Man City game, 
Copenhagen manager comes out and says, listen, come here, we can maybe sneak a draw, maybe sneak a wee 1-0 victory, eight minutes in, he's 2-0 down. Everything that you have worked on as a club, as a manager, as a coach, as a player, has just went right out the window. And I've stood at the side of Parkhead before, Parkhead and Ibrox, and you've worked extremely hard within that working week to try and your game plan, and it's, it's gone within five, ten minutes of the, the games. His counterpart this weekend, Brendan Rodgers, was cited by the SFA for venting his frustrations over match officials last Sunday. But David Martindale insists that all managers have felt aggrieved at some point this season. I think every manager sitting here feels the same. No matter where you are, Celtic Rangers, Hearts, Hills, Aberdeen, St John's, St Mother, Motherwell, Livingston, Kilmarnock, every manager will be sitting in the seat thinking they're hard done me. Now that doesn't matter, or you bought me a league at Livingston, every man, we all probably feel the same. And I think, take VAR out of the equation, you'd have probably been sitting here with the same feelings from on-field decisions if VAR wasn't involved. So I just think it's competitive football, eh? it's uh, the winner in us all. Will we have a cup upset on our hands? We'll find out this Sunday kickoff is at 2.30. It's a good point that David Martindale makes because I was I was at a championship game the other week there, Ruffy, and I ran into a manager and he said to me, "Isn't it great? No VAR tonight." <laughs> <laughs> That's how they feel yeah, about I'd, it. I'd, 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 yeah, I'd, I would love to see what the referees say when they don't have a VAR. You know, it'd be interesting yeah. to get an opinion of you know, are they more relaxed about it? That it's their decision they're making, they stand by it. Or, it would just be interesting at the end of the season because they do all these reviews anyway and see where we are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a good question you made there, Rob. I think referees, I think referees welcome it uh, in the main, but you know we all welcomed it. If we could look back on Peter and Ruffy. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, football shows. I wanted that in. The one thing yeah, I do absolutely. think, the one thing I think about, and, and last weekend is actually a perfect example at Tynecastle when you have John Beaton, who's a VAR operator now. Uh, John Beaton is regarded as one of the very best officials that we have. I do wonder about how influential having a senior figure on VAR is if you have a younger referee going over to the monitor and someone else says to you, it's definitely a penalty. No, no, you've got it wrong. It's, it's definitely a penalty. It's very hard to say. Well, can I just Hang interject on, I think... quickly on that? I do Alan. wonder about that. You and I are, there's that seat. <laughs> I'm going to argue with you here. There's no way, surely, a VAR gentleman is saying this is definitely a penalty. I think I think their line has to be delay, delay, delay. We think you've made a clear and obvious error. Come back and look at this. Yeah, incident. the language obviously yeah. the lines. Same but thing. I do wonder. I do uh, if somebody says to you, "I've seen a clear and obvious error. Watch it back." And you watch it back, and the first time you think, "I've not seen it." Do you think he says that again? It. Do you think somebody? I, says I think it again? maybe there's just a silence. But That's if someone says to them. you, "I can see an obvious, a clear and obvious error," immediately you're thinking, "I've made a mistake." Yeah. I've made a mistake. Yeah. I've got it wrong. Would you like to hear them saying the next I would like to I hear see all, all of it. it. Yeah. I, I think it would be, I think the next step is to release the audio, not just from sporadic games or not if there's been a moment of contention where people have asked for it, but I think it would be helpful to be able to hear the audio uh, and to hear how a conclusion w was reached. And also I think for fans within the stadium, I think during games it can be so frustrating when you think, what is anyone looking at? Yeah. But why does everybody uh, assume as soon as the referee goes over to the screen that means it's going to be the decision? I think he's 90 Everybody said, more than oh, that. he's going over to the screen, that means it's a penalty. But I think what, what, that's what you've seen. Usually change it's, it. I think yeah. the evidence that you've seen since VR was introduced, that invariably that is what happens. Mm. It's quite rare for it to have no consequence. But as, well, as of course, Peter said, it'd be great if the referee went over and. Upstairs says, I think you've made it, and he goes, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying, I think that must that would be quite difficult to do. If you're a younger referee and you know you've got a more experienced official who's in charge of VR, I think that would mm -hmm. I think that'd be quite a hard thing to do. The reason why the majority of them are changed, Ruffy, is because VAR as a technology is there to offer another angle that the referee hasn't seen to give him a better chance of coming to the decision. What we all have a problem with is even when sometimes getting that angle, mm. he comes to a decision which some of us are bemused because even with three or four angles, it's not the decision he should have made. And we wonder what influence is coming to him while he's looking at four or five angles, four or five stills, the point again, five minutes has now passed, and still 
Who? Is somebody in his ear? Is he being shown one mm -hmm. particular yeah. angle to then try mm. and influence his mindset to say this little touch over the top of his head, the studs were too near his head. The studs were too near his head. Let's look at that frame again and slow it down. His, do you oh, know yeah, what I mean? And the slowing it down is a big problem as when, well. When, when, like you, when you, you screenshot anything, Peter, it looks worse. Yeah. You could have a, one of the best tackles ever. You win the ball and you could still you know, have a still of it when they follow yeah. through and you think, oh, that's a bad tackle. Yeah, so yeah. everything that's slowed down Peter's and it's paused, it looks bad. Up, up in that thing, haven't you? And you've yes. seen the screens and mm -hmm. you're saying that they're, they're looking at that four or five times, they're looking at that, they're looking at that, they're looking at that. How can they then come out and say we've had 17 wrong? How can 17 decisions that they've made been wrong? Well, because they're if they're, if they're If they're looking at it four and five times and this angle and that angle. Well, because you can't throw out what Brendan Rodgers is saying which is quite simply, and another, a few managers have, have pointed this out, we have to hold our hands up and say some, some officials, whether they're refs or whether they're VR officials, are not up to it. We don't have a high standard here. We might have two or three really good referees, by the way, but they are completely forgotten about in the standard and the level that we have officiating in this country. And there, you know, for all the great games that one or two officials do have, it's being lost in this constant scrutiny, assessment, anger, criticism because of the inept performances of others. And I include VAR officials. A lot of it doesn't have to be scrutinised. You know, you go back to the Rossi, it's at his hand. Oh, that, that, that's incredible how you don't see that on a screen. Yeah. yeah. You see the one at Ten Castle that is given, and you think, how can that? Well, it's the incons—I think bonkers. it's the inconsistency yeah. of decision, decisions that really frustrate managers. Yeah. I think you'd saw it at Fir Park uh, a couple of Sundays ago. I think Theo Bear on Liam Scales, a, a very similar challenge to the one that Yang gets sent off. You can see why people yeah. are exasperated. It, some things that are, are given the most severest of sanctions and some that aren't sanctioned at all for what looks like very similar incidents. Well, listen, we've had three managers on, all talking about it. Um, Brendan Rodgers, valid points, he'll get a fine. <laughs> Philip Clement mentioned the handball, too harsh. David Martindale, equally so, talking about it. Nick Montgomery, last week in the derby, came out right after it, mentioned VAR. It is at the forefront of managers' minds and it's annoying fans. Something has to change in the summer. I don't know if you caught the vibe on it, Ali, but uh, while he's putting his point across, he's looking at me and you angrily as if it's your <laughs> fault just because we are just because we are highlighting the points to him. Uh, calm down, Ruffy. Nice to him. Yeah, Aberdeen <laughs> Kelly. Um, oh, jeez, Aberdeen. Um, is, I mean, this 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 isn't. I think this is a dandy Don's day. Yes, I do. Yeah? I think that uh, they're going to win this one. They're going to go into the semi-final. And uh, I think they deserve a wee rub of the green. And uh, I know Kilmarnock are the team on form between the two of them, but in certain games I've seen Aberdeen last week, they could have seen it out, but they never. But there's something just waiting to click there for them. I don't yeah. think they're a great side. Have you seen evidence, Rocky? I have seen evidence. I've seen <laughs> was, this on a, was this on a no, VAR? No, not over I, 90 I didn't minutes. See it. Did you? No, over 90 minutes. <laughs> over segments of a game. Right. If they can manage a game properly... I think I, I, I'm going to go for Aberdeen. Yeah, Neil Warnock, um, one game, Bonnie Rig Rose. Um, <laughs> it's a 10 game winless run. And I had Kenny, um, who is uh, living out in uh, Los Angeles, sends his regular messages on Aberdeen. He's a big Dons fan and he stays in contact regularly. Um, I've never met him, by the way, he just tells me all the time. Uh, about who he thinks is going to come in as manager. That was his longest email uh, in a while. But he is like so many Dons fans, looking at this debacle and thinking, you're not going to put Audrey in thinking this is a this is a shoe and you're against an old manager that you wanted rid of who could come here and take the scalp. Yeah, I think Kilmarnock will win. On, uh, <coughs> and I think they'll win comfortably uh, on Saturday. I, just, uh, I think by a couple of goals. Yeah. I, I just think, to know know know, I, I think Aberdeen look... Roughly to know. No. I think Aberdeen you think for Aberdeen? No, I say two no, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two I'll just say they'll win the game. Yeah, two no, no. all right, okay. I'm not that confident. It's a comfortable two no for you. No, I did, I've, I've seen nothing from Aberdeen that would lead me to think that they're anywhere near getting out the bat. I mean, they've lost all their meetings against them this season. The, the thing with Aberdeen is they can't <laughs> defend. They're, they're defensively, they're so poor, Peter, they're losing goals. And if Miofsky doesn't score... Nobody else is scoring, apart from the boy who scored the wonder goal the other day, Conor Barron, for about 30 yards. There's nobody scoring a goal for them. 
So I don't think Kamala are great away from home. They're much better at home. But I agree with Ali. I think they'll go up there. And if Kamala scores the first goal, it's going to be toxic at Petodre. You know, they're going to be under severe pressure. And I think Aberdeen's season will be done on Sunday. So I think Saturday they'll do it. Yeah. Can I ask you this question? Um, is it breaking point? To lose to Kilmarnock at Petodre in the Cup and effectively then be facing a relegation I, I battle. think it'll be Neil Warnock's decision. I, don't, I, I can't see Aberdeen <coughs> sacking another manager. Um, I think if Neil maybe thinks he's had enough or he can't improve the situation, then he would walk away. Um, he but said I, he doesn't do walking away. Well, he's not going to walk away then, so I think it'll be the end of the season regardless. Yeah. Um, do you but think, well, well, I think Aberdeen will sack another manager, surely. Well, can I ask you this? Uh, I noticed he's getting a little bit prickly about it. He was talking about the fact that um, you know, Neil Lennon's the latest to throw his hat in. We knew that yeah. for weeks that he was um, there. <laughs> as said info. Well, of course, that's <laughs> the other thing about it. But, but the point here is, I don't know why Neil Warnock is getting prickly about it. He's been asked to do a job. He's got a great CV, but he hasn't been able to get a trick out of this bunch of underachievers. Um, and quite simply... Everybody's speculating on who the next manager is because he's only here in a short-term deal anyway, so I don't know why he's getting his knickers in a twist. The only problem he did say was, will Willie Miller be his assistant? Because clearly he's not happy that Willie has savaged him on BBC. Yeah, well, listen, obviously Willie Miller's a huge figure up in Aberdeen. You know, he'll be, you know, and I'd assume that he, Neil's living up in the North East. I think he'll be up there and he'll, he'll be reading stuff and he'll be hearing stuff, uh, what Willie Miller's saying about him. And I think he will be, it will be annoying him, but that, that's what happens with every manager. You know, people are, are going to be critical if you're not doing well, you're right. And, you know, whether it's Neil Lennon, whether it's anybody else, you know, Aberdeen's a massive job. You've got to go and win games, Peter, and he's only won one game, Bonnie Rig Rose. He's got to start winning games or he's going to be under even more pressure. So I don't see them winning. I think they'll, I think they'll go out the cup and then they've just got to try and stay in the division, I think. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I, I am not criticising Willie Miller. I think he's actually he's right. entitled to his opinion. No, no not, not only that, I think he's right on the basis. I mean, I, I was up at Pedodri watching them against Livingston. They were rank rotten. And actually, their defence was so bad that Willie Miller looked at me in the press box. I looked at him and I thought, you better get warmed up because you, <laughs> you're, you're better than what they've got in the back. <laughs> they were murdered. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if there'd been any other manager had been brought in that one one in what is it ten or something like that, they'd be under pressure as well. I think if he does lose the game and as as uh, Tam says, all hell will break loose. I, I think he should go. I, I think he, for the best for him. I, I don't see why you'd wait for a new manager at the end of the season. Get him in now. That you've had enough time. He seems to have been there so that they could sift through what's available. So I would be sifting through very quickly if they get beat. Because I think Tam's right, the fans won't accept it. So I would bring somebody in and get them to try and turn things around before the end of the season. I would maintain, I mean, I know we've mentioned Malky Mackay, I know we've mentioned Stephen Robinson. I think Stephen Robinson would be the natural choice because I think if Alan Burrows has got an influence, um, then Stephen Robinson would be the next Aberdeen manager for me. I think he's a great candidate if they want to make a fresh start, if they want to try and have a clear out if that is possible, depending on the deals with the players. For me, Stephen Robinson, front runner. If they want to be a club that's ruthless, wants a fight, wants a siege mentality, and wants to produce a winning team with players from a manager who knows and has a CV to back it up, if they want to change their mentality, then Neil Lennon's the obvious choice for me. Either one of those two will change the the mentality up at Aberdeen because they've got experience. Um, I just think if they want to be ruthless, they want to pick a fight, they want to get you know get angry and get some of the underachievers out. Lennon's your man, Robinson front runner for me. Yeah, I think the, the Robinson one, the, the complications would be obviously on leaving St Mirren. I don't know how kind of contract he's got there. That could cost him, and stuff. That could yeah. cost him a few bob, and then he thing made nails an easy gig. You know, he's an easy. He's, he's done the CV, and you just have to look at what he did at Hibs. You know, look at the way, the way the crowd went from that to that because they loved everything that was going on. And, and ask any players that played with him, you know, he, he, he had them, you know, at a level that he was at and then he pulled them all up there. And for a while, it was very, very good. So, I mean, he's 
he's done it all. Yeah, and let's not forget also, um, you know, sometimes it's be careful what you wish for. Derek McInnes was up there, um, and certainly <coughs> some people will look at just one trophy and maybe thought Derek should have achieved more, but you certainly can't view him as a failure up at Aberdeen, Derek McInnes. And he was quick to point out ahead of this game, uh, the budget that he had is vastly different from what Aberdeen have got now. You no, know, we, we had a brilliant time at Aberdeen. You know, I think um, you know we won the League Cup in our first year. It was a team with a lot of academy graduates. I know the budget I was working at um, at that time um, was um, night and day for what it is now. Um, we had young academy players playing like Shaughnessy and Nicky Lowe and Cammy Smith and Andy Constein, Ryan Jack, um, Russell Anderson, boys that came through the academy, and nobody was probably really expecting us to to win a cup after finishing. I think that Aberdeen had finished ninth, I think, the season before, so... It just shows you, he's just rhymed off a whole number of players that came through the academy. Where are they? You know, where are those players? Yeah, to... There's not many coming through now, Peter, is there? No. Um, I think the boy Ramsey's probably the only one that they've mm. brought through and, and sold for money. Um, to and he can't get a game in the loan. Yeah, uh, to, to Liverpool. Uh, they'll probably lose Conor Barron, I think, at the end of the season. I don't think he's signed a new deal. Yep. They'll, they'll lose him, but... I think he's bang on there. I think that he done a great job at Aberdeen, but the Aberdeen fans wanted sexier football, you know, and, and you know, sexier football with younger managers. And they've tried them all. You know, they tried my mate Stephen Glass, you know, Jim Goodwin, Barry Robson, and maybe you're right. Maybe it's just a maybe it is a Stephen Robinson or a Neil Lennon that knows how to win games. It's not going to be pretty at times, but Scottish football is not about being pretty. It's about being pragmatic, winning your battles, winning games. And that's what Derek McInnes is great at. Not only you know, now at Kamala, but Aberdeen as well. Uh, and a lot of Aberdeen fans kind of chased him out the door up there as well. So I wonder how they, they'll feel if he comes back up and puts the, you know, the knife in again to Aberdeen. As he's put in, I think they've beat, they've beat Aberdeen every game this season. So yeah. If you go and make it four in a row, you know, you're thinking to yourself, why do we let this guy go out the door? Yeah. Well, you, prediction? 2-1 uh, to Kamala. 2-1 to Kamala for me. 2-0. 2-0. 1 Aberdeen. 2-1 Aberdeen. Ah, you got a gig up there this yeah. week? No? Just checking, <laughs> just checking. Um, OK, uh, give us your prediction as well. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Uh, right across our social media, we'll keep you up to date with all the uh, quarterfinal ties and, of course, all the other breaking news in football if you download the app. Um, so that's the weekend games. When we hit Monday, it's Morton against Hearts. And this one is... At Caffalo, not a foregone conclusion. No, it's not. Certainly been down there on numerous occasions, possibly one of the hardest stadiums to win something at. I think the Hearts players will get an eye opener when they walk in there and walk around that wee corridor and then <laughs> turn and if you duck, you know, hit your head in one of the, ball, one of the metal barriers and then you, you it's get the in the smallest distance. distance. It's the smallest uh, distance uh, in the world, isn't it? By the way, 4,000 4, 4, fans. Morton sold the tickets. Yeah, oh, they're great. great. Yeah. They're, they've got right behind the team and they've been on a fantastic run. OK, they've lost their last two games, but they've pulled themselves into a uh, playoff place and that's what, this will be a battle. Yeah. You're talking about getting a manager in to show somebody how to, how to scrap. They'll be scrapping for everything and uh, I think it's going to be a difficult one for them. Yeah, um, in the capital, Kerry Pollock, she's been busy today. Uh, she was speaking to Stephen Naismith. This weekend, Stephen Naismith prepares his side to take on Greenock Morton in the quarter-finals of the Scottish Cup. And despite almost securing third place in the league, he says there's nothing better than lifting silverware at the National Stadium. It's a, without a doubt, it's a memorable... If you win a trophy, like I said, for players, the feeling of all your hard work, the enjoyment, the aftermath of it, the party, the... And you, celebrating all with your teammates, with your family, and everybody's one group is amazing. That then extends out to the fans because they get to enjoy that moment and 20 years time they remember these moments when they win comp competitions. And despite their win over Celtic at the weekend, Stephen Naismith insists that there was no raised eyebrows over their win over the Parkhead outfits. I think in the past you can definitely see that teams do win old firm games and get into the next game and they lose and things that happens. I don't. Th I think we've moved on from that type of feeling because we should be competing against them. It's not. We're no shocked that we beat Celtic on Sunday. We had, we know we need to work hard and we need to do it, but we gave it when we believe. Um, so that is, it just builds a confidence going out throughout the season. Can Hearts make it to Hamden for the second time this season? We'll find out this Monday night. Kickoff is at seven forty-five. 
Yeah, that's what you call a typical old uh, Scottish Cup tie. Do you know, Ruffy, if we um, travelled to Capolo in your old uh, Sunbeam Rapier, I don't think anybody would bat an eyelid. No, you'd just, be, you'd just be driven into the car park as if it was... <laughs> <laughs> Get into the car park there, they chip your way up the top and you walk <laughs> yeah. all the way in. Oh, skis pieces, about 50 yards. <laughs> You'd think you would have been asked to get a bus back. Um, okay. Um, De Morton have a chance, albeit uh, <clears throat> the big blow is one of their goal scorers, George Oakley, is yeah, not there. Yeah, yeah. He's, they've missed him the last couple of games, Peter. Um, I don't think they've scored a goal. The Inverness at home and then Dunyant at home, two, two poor results. And just at the wrong time, you want to get into this game with momentum. Um, I think Hearts will win this game comfortably, Peter. I think it'll be a battle. First 20 minutes, 25 minutes, that'll be a bit of digging. Uh, but I think Hearts will be too much quality and I think it'll be 3 1. I think Shankland will score a hat trick. Yeah? Yeah, I think Shankland will score a hat trick. That's the kind of punditry you're getting on this programme now, Ruffy. He's got 13 and 13 against Morton in his career. I think he'll make it 16. Played with Morton, didn't he? I don't know if he played with Morton, but he's, yeah. he's got a great scoring record against him. But I'm just saying, Ruffy's saying when the goals are going to be scored in injury time, and you're giving us it's a hat trick. Yeah, this is <laughs> money on it, Ruffy. Pressure on me. I'm just about to say, <laughs> could you offer us anything on this? It's International Women's Day, for God's sake. Uh, what, what minute will the goal be scored? <laughs> goals. Um, yeah, I think Hearts will win comfortably, but I think, uh, yeah, I think they'll, uh, the first half hour or so will be a fight and a scrap. It's such a tight wee ground and, you know, it'll be fairly atmospheric, as you saw when Motherwell came a cropper last month. But I think Hearts have got enough to get through it. Yeah. It, hearts win? Yeah. It's a Hearts win, but as the guys are saying, it's a battle. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, it just shows you how mad football is. We caught up with Anne Budge, obviously, uh, this week. And, you know, from a position of... A few months ago when people were questioning uh, Stevie Naismith, now Anne Budge is talking about the possibility that bigger clubs could be coming to steal their manager. Um, I'd love him to really build his career with us and I don't think he's in a particular rush to go elsewhere. That said, I'm not naive and if someone comes in and makes him a fantastic offer, would he consider it? Potentially. But he's got a lot going for him here. Um, he's having success. He knows he's got the backing of the board and everyone's involved with the club. Um, and I think he's enjoying it. He keeps telling me he is anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, full match to Matt. I, I've got a lot of time for Stephen, a former employee yeah. here, when we uh, obviously had to downgrade who came in after him. Um, anyway, apart from that, I'd like to see him stay. I'd like to. I think he would stay. Yeah. It would have to be a big, big club to try and get him away from there. I think the fans have now bought into him, so he'll be loving every minute and the results against Celtic will, will help that. So I, I can't see him going anywhere. No, absolutely. And Shanklin, I don't know what all the consternation was about. They already said he had a deadline. He's not signed the deal. Do you expect him to go in the summer? I think Hearts need to sell him in the summer. I think if they're going to get the peak amount for the mo money for him, they can't afford for him to let it run to next January, then they can speak to the clubs and go on a free. I don't think Hearts are under any pressure. I think financially they are secure. Hearts, they might think, well, we'll just let them go for nothing. We'd yeah. rather have them for a, another, what, 18 months um, and just forget the, the transfer fee. But I think business-wise, business, business -wise, with the business head on, I think they'll look to try and sell them in the summer. You and I should have been uh, somewhere on Sunday. Where, where, where should we be? The 10th, even though it's Mother's Day. You and I should be at Anfield, shouldn't we? Man City, Liverpool. That's yeah. going to be a cracker. Oh, it's a great Super Sunday, actually. There's some great games on. Yeah. yeah, you'll be hoping obviously Liverpool can yep. can turn Man City over. Not get, with the injuries, I'm not so sure. Yeah, <laughs> great result last night for Liverpool, obviously yeah. uh, in Europe. This is going to be an absolute cracker. I mean, yeah. I'm looking forward to this game. Man City, Liverpool, both will attack each other. Uh, you know, point in it. I think Man City will win, and they'll go in and win the league. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay, that's Sam's <laughs> opinion. Uh, Ruffy, you and I have had a long friendship together. Yeah. There's we were very. On a par with each other, there's a friendship there that cannot be broken, a bond, an understanding. Who do you think is going to win? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely. I don't, even, I don't even know. I, I surely can't look to Alison for friendship on this day. No, I, I'm going with City. I'm Are you? Sorry. Oh. I, as much as I'd, I'd like to see Liverpool yeah. win and I'd like <clears> to see Liverpool go on and win the title, but I'd I, realistically, I don't think it's going. Big boost last night. Salah back on the bench. Did they get on at any point? Salah. I didn't see the, the end of the game, oh, but he was yeah. on the bench. I didn't see. I was watching Rangers. If, he, <laughs> if he's back, if he's back fit, 
then that obviously strengthens your hand. Yeah, absolutely. And Nunez is, is absolutely superb mm -hmm. as well. Um, OK, I'm going to go for a, a narrow 3-0 win for Liverpool, mm -hmm. um, just to, to make my weekend. Anyway, uh, listen, uh, enjoy Mother's Day. Uh, it's International Women's Day today. Um, for all of us, it should be International Women's Day every day, Ali, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know why we're just highlighting one day, to be perfectly honest with you, but... I could give you a few reasons. I'm just reading from the script that my wife has written down here for me, <laughs> as ever. Um, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. I do hope you enjoy all our chat. Uh, there's a great one-to-one -one straight talk uh, this week with uh, Jerry McCabe, um, who is just absolutely sensational. Um, not only does he talk about his career as a player where he was super skillful, a brilliant player. He also talks about players that he uh, managed alongside Bobby Williamson who just didn't apply themselves and ended up wasting their career. Um, it's a great insight from Jerry <laughs> into players like that. Um, it was it's because not, he had not 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 yeah. the right suit he took me on. <laughs> I look forward to seeing that. It's absolutely. The only time I was there, I've seen him. It's absolutely magnificent. Uh, you really will enjoy it. Um, and don't forget, uh, of course, we have Kerry's Premiership Preview Show every Saturday. Uh, we also have the journals, which is causing a fair bit of consternation. Four journalists arguing with each other. What more could you ask for, apart from a tenants and a wee Southern Comfort Lemonade Chaser? From Ruffy, from Alison, uh, from Tammy McManus, and from myself, Peter Martin, thank you for listening and thank you for watching.